Thanks for being part of In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics, as always, coming from our outstanding studios. And we have an ex- outstanding guest, Solomon Wilcots, analyst extraordinaire, former safety for the Cincinnati Bengals, member of the SWAT team, played in the Super Bowl 23, knows what he speaks of when he's talking about the Cincinnati Bengals and the organization. He's got a lot to say about what took place up there in the, on the lake in Cleveland. Bengals lose to the Cleveland Browns to go 0-3 in the division. How do you bounce back? We'll find out. Good stuff from Solly. Thanks for joining us once again in the trenches with Dave Lapham brought to you by First Star Logistics as always coming to you from our studios that are as good as we could ever hope for. And so's our guest, Solomon Wilcots. Enough said right there, media mogul. But before that was an outstanding defensive back for the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, Did played at a very high level for, for a lot of years. Super smart very instinctive, understands the game of football. And you can see that now as you listen to Solly do all of his broadcast and media responsibilities and, and they are numerous. And, um, Solly, once again, appreciate you joining us in the program, sir. Well, uh, uh, good to be with you as usual. I I wish it was under less sobering circumstances. (laughs) I'll tell you, I, I mean, the Bengals may have played their worst game of the season. The Browns probably played their best, and what you got was yeah. ugly, wasn't it? Exactly, it was. And, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you know, they say styles make fights, you know, in, in the game of boxing. Uh, this was two teams with two different styles. One team wants to throw it down the field. One team wants to use the passing game to feature their talent on offense. The other team wishes they had our talent on offense, uh, so what they want to do is muddy it up and make it a physical game using the run game, obviously featuring Nick Chubb. Uh, and they were able to dictate terms. They were able to make it their style of fight. And that's why they were able to come away with a winner. And something tells me that's why they've been able to win five in a row. And it's something that we certainly need to pay attention to. No doubt. I mean, there's always somebody that has your number as such, I guess, you know, and, and Joe Burrow's 0-4. They've lost five in a row, but that last game, uh, last matchup with Cleveland, the Bengals rested everybody. They already clinched the division, and they didn't want to get anybody hurt. So that one's kind of a, you know, an outlier. But the others, I mean, hey, fair and square, legit. And you make a great point. The Cleveland Browns rush the ball 44 times for 172 yards. The Bengals rush it a franchise record low 10 times in a game. 10 times. So, yeah, you yeah. talk about uh, North and South Pole in terms of philosophy. It's it's amazing. And some of that is dictated because they jump out to a, what, sure. 11, 11 point lead. And then, right. you know, in a game where we don't, our defense hadn't given up a touchdown all year in the second half, they come out, score two quick touchdowns. They end up with three second half touchdowns in a game yep. and forced us to throw. And I, but I, even when we came out, if you look at our early scripted plays, we were throwing it. Yep, and thinking less about running it. So this, you could say it was unintentional, but in a way, we were trending uh, in that direction. Maybe we would have ran it more than ten times, but not much more than that day. To be honest with you, um, look, we we know we have the better quarterback. I think I think if we step back now, as we approach the halfway point, we got to begin to look at the more fundamental things about how teams are built and how they're constructed. Um, we have the better quarterback, but they have some more other fundamental things. Uh, one of the best offensive lines in football. Yep. They have one of the best pass rushers in football who could end up having a Hall of Fame career. Um, Denzel Ward didn't play last night, but he's been featured in many of these wins uh, where Cleveland has has outplayed us. But he is a, a cornerstone of, of a defense at the secondary position. That's vitally important to have a great defense, right? And yep. so they they've got some of the key fundamental building blocks to a really good football team. Not to mention the running uh, back of, of Nick Chubb, who has he compares uh, to some historical figures when you talk about 
his career yards per carry average being north of five yards per carry for his career. Only uh, guys like Barry Sanders and Jim Brown have seen these kind of numbers. And that's what kind of running back Nick Chubb is. And so I, I think that's why they have the number. They have some of those really uh, fundamental building blocks to what should be a great football team. They're waiting for the quarterback to really show up. Once it does, tell me right now, they're going to be more than a handful. No doubt about it. And um, Chubb, with over 100 yards last night, is right around 850 yards rushing in, uh, in you know in in uh, in eight football games, and he's got 10 rushing touchdowns now, and he's the fifth uh, player with eight or more touchdowns in his first five years, and the other four. Like you're talking about, Solly, Jim Brown, Emmett Smith, Ladanian Tomlinson, and Adrian Peterson. Pretty good roll call right there. <laughs> Look, I, I knew the day he was drafted. Um, I said, oh my goodness, he's gonna be a handful. Because I was I was watching to see where Nick Chubb was going. I knew teams would pass on him in the first round. This is a guy that was uh uh be, you know this close to being a Heisman trophy winner. Yeah. at the University of Georgia. Then he blows out his knee, comes back the next year. You know what that next year is like. Maybe not um, the same as you were when you were healthy. But then he got drafted that year. That's why he fell into the second round. This guy was a premium player at the collegiate level. Um, and uh, we knew he would be a superstar in our league. It was just about getting with the right team to use him in the right way. Um, and look, he's sharing a backfield with another guy, <laughs> Kareem Hunt who once led the league in rushing himself as a rookie in 2017. So they, again, they've got, and they've got one of the best offensive lines in football. Yep. Um, and, and obviously we can't talk enough about Miles Garrett. So um, that's what you saw uh, transpire in the Monday night game. Those elements played their best um, for the Cleveland Browns. And meanwhile, um, it's the same old story. Our offensive line, despite, putting a lot of resources into that area of the football team. It has yet to yield good results. We've missed in that area. I think we all have to look in the mirror and say, we, we've we've not good, done good enough. And we have to say that because it's the only mindset that's going to allow us to really apply ourselves to get it right. And we have to get it right if we're going to project um, that Joe Burrow is going to be a championship winner over the course of – his NFL career. If that is our forward projection, then the only way that happens is we got to protect Joe Burrow much better than we've done uh, in the early portion of his career. No question about it. And what what is it about primetime game, Solly, on the road? Uh, the Bengals now, this is their 13th straight loss on the road in primetime, most in an NFL history. One in 24 in the last 25 games on the road in primetime. Unbelievable. I mean, it's and, and you know some teams have your number, I guess, as such. And it seems like the Cleveland Browns definitely, you know, have have the have have their number. But you've you've been there. You you played a lot of years in the league. It, it's that first turnover, they couldn't get over it. You know what I mean? It's like they're moving. Higgins is wide open in the red zone, and Miles Garrett on an RPO times it perfectly, gets the tip, and Higgins tries to make the play and double tip, and it's picked. And that's all he talked about after the game was that that first interception. And I agree. If they score first, which they wanted to do, just like they've been doing when they were playing well, they felt like the whole thing would have, would have unfolded differently. But you can't let a turnover like that paralyze you and carry over and lead to another mistake or another mistake or a poor play or whatever. You have to have that short-term memory, don't you? Oh, there's no doubt. Uh, look, when things don't go your way, you can't be thinking about, okay, there's our, our best plan was to come in doing X or Y. And then when that sort of looks bleak or when that maybe fails, you don't say, okay, therein, therein lies the game. Oh, okay, we're already behind the eight ball, so now we're battling uphill. No, you just, you just got to keep battling it. It's no longer an uphill battle. It's just a battle, and you got to be ready to persevere through that. That's where – just becoming more mentally tough and a more mentally uh, mature football team. Uh, I find that that typically happens when you talk about on the road, um, 
rhythm uh, not quite being there. That tends to happen more on the offensive side than the defensive side. You know, defenses, we already know the odds are stacked against us. We already know that we're, we're going to have to really, um, you know, uh, work our tails off in order to get things turned around, that it's going to be hard. Um, offenses tend to want to come out and they want to get in the rhythm. That's why they script their early plays. Sure. <laughs> because they rhythm is so important to what right. it is that they do. And then when that rhythm is somehow broken, okay, that chain and that link is snapped. It's as if they unravel uh, and, and don't have a means to gather themselves uh, to be able to regain their rhythm and get back in stride. The ball was tipped. The ball was intercepted. But how come the second possession? Now we go multiple three and outs. Um, we don't score until, uh, you know, the second half of the ball game. Uh, and it's just one thing compounded after another. And our pass protection uh, suffered on the road. For whatever reason, the crowd no ways and all of those things, as you well know, can disrupt um, the pre-snap communication of an offense, the communication of an offensive line when sliding protections and picking up stunts and games that the defense is going to try to give you. Um, and then the offense becomes susceptible to this sort of frenetic pacing that's not the normal rhythm and how they would like to operate. So we both – Played on Super Bowl teams. I played in Super Bowl 16. You played in Super Bowl 23. And the team went to Super Bowl 56 last year. Common thread avoided the biggest variable that you can't control whatsoever is injury. And yeah. you, you don't want to have an injury to a key performer that keeps them out for a, a stretch of time. Um, and, and every time we went to the Super Bowl, we avoided that. I mean, that that's, that's a factor. And in most playoff teams, that's the situation as well. Going to last night's game, Jamar Chase is down, and he's going to be down for multiple weeks. How many? You know, is multiple only two? Is it three? Is it four? We don't know yet. Stanley Morgan's down for the second straight week with a hamstring injury, so they're limping and gimping at the, at the receiver position. And then during the course of the game, Awuzie uh, tears his ACL, and he's he's that that's the best cover guy. Your best receiver's down, best cover guy goes down. And uh, also during the course of the game, Trey Flowers, who's – taking his spot, pulls his hamstring. I mean, they're, they're putting Dax Hill at an outside corner against Cooper, and he doesn't have any experience. I mean, not that's the kind of thing that you want to try to avoid, and you have no control over that, but you do. You have to adjust. I mean, that's where your roster depth and, and the development of your team comes into play. Yeah, that was rather unfortunate to put the rookie in that situation. Dax Hill, uh, as versatile as he is, he is not an outside corner. Right. OK, let's just, you know, football players, we specialize in our training to do a, to do certain things. And then if we're really multiple, we can do some other things. But it's it's asking a lot of a rookie on Monday Night Football against Amari Cooper, for crying out loud. Right. right. To go to the outside and on the perimeter and play corner. Uh, he was neither in press coverage. Right. And nor was he from off. He was sort of caught in no man's land, as we would call it. Uh, not enough to get hands on him or reroute him. Um, he was just, he was caught standing straight legged, standing up. It was almost like he wasn't prepared when the ball was snapped. Um, he was supposed to have help over the top in Von Bell, who got caught disguising and didn't get over the top immediately. There was just no sense of urgency from us on defense on that particular play. And we gave up a big one. And we don't, you know, to the, to this defense's group, to their credit, they don't have a lot of uh, lapses. They don't give up big plays. They're not lackadaisical. They're very focused. They're highly trained. They do communicate well. But this is one of those nights. I, maybe because it was Halloween. Maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe we had the – there was someone casting a spell on this group because I saw a lot of things that were really out of character and out of the norm. Not just for the guys on defense, but uh, some of the things that we saw happen um, uh, for the football team as a whole. On third down, Solly, Amari Cooper uh, was immense. His third down numbers, he had three catches for 80 yards. And it was third and five for 29, third and four for 18, third and nine for 33. 
Yeah. And guys, the disturbing part, they just, you know, weren't open or made, con they didn't make contested catches and they weren't just open. They were wide open. Wide I mean, open. Five yeah. yards separate. It was like, what is going on? What did you see? What was your yeah. thought when you watched that? There was just no uh, real sense of understanding how to match up to the routes. Like, so for instance, there was one, uh, I think we sort of mugged up to the line like we were going to bring pressure. Um, we brought some guys, but dropped some guys like Sam Hubbard, for instance. Yep. Yep. He's dropping to the flat. Well, he's an edge rusher by trade. Yep. Uh, he does get in proximity of the route, but not <laughs> close enough to, to deter Jacoby Brissett from even throwing it, let alone steal the passing lane. So right. we, we, we call that covering grass. You know, you're, you're out there, you're over there. It's a zone concept. And was he in the area? Yeah. But not, you, you've got, you can't just cover grass. You've got to be able to match up to the patterns of routes. Um, and for defensive linemen, that's a little bit more higher level of thinking. It would be like taking me as a as a defensive back and saying, okay, Solomon, you're going to rush in these cases. You're going to not rush in this case. You're going to uh, uh, blitz the B gap if this happens or blitz the C gap if another thing happens. Right. Well, I'm going to have to really be in tune to a lot of those probabilities because that's what you get when you get um, patterns that are happening and they're really happening behind you not in front of you because he's up on the line and then having to drop back, but you got to know how to get that head back and find the guy because when one guy disappears or go inside, another guy is coming out and you've got to be able to have eyes inside as well as uh, behind you outside. Again, that's asking a lot of them, but listen, Sam Hubbard used to be a defensive back. He could do it. It's just that it takes a lot of reps and, and you have to have a great feel for that. And it's not something that he's asked to do uh, at a high level, just sort of here and there. And I, I think if you were to talk to Luana Romer, he would say, you know what, they got us on that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they had won four out of five. And everybody's, I have them. It looks like they've turned it around. Here they go. And then stub their toe, obviously, on Monday night football and, and, and lose a game by a significant margin to a, to a team that nobody expected that to be the case. So you've been in that situation. I've been in that situation. How do you recover? What do you, what do you do? You have a short week. It's a home game. Thank goodness. I don't have to travel short week and travel would be brutal, but short week. And you go to pay stadium, and you're at home yeah. and you're playing the Carolina Panthers and people are like, Oh yeah, that's a gimme. That's a, that's a W. They beat up the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady, and they're playing for Wilkes now. They they love that guy. They're yeah. playing hard for that guy. Sure. This is going to be a, a physical challenge. How do you get ready for it, Solly? What do you do? And they nearly beat the Falcons, a team we beat two weeks ago. They nearly sure. beat them on Sunday. Sure. Uh, had yep. the game more. They conduct themselves maybe a little bit better, right, uh, yep. and make a field goal in overtime. They win the game. Yep. Um, I think you've got to be able to, to really dial in to when we've lost games, how we've lost, because it, it helps you to get better as a football team. And I think in some of the games that we've lost, we've been sort of um, – the other team has taken it to our offensive line. They win the physical battle in the trenches. I think it's, I think it's quite clear we miss DJ Reader. We miss Josh Tupo. Uh, they bring a, a tremendous physical presence to us on our defensive line. Sure. So I think – I think those are key elements that you've got. Look, you're not going to get if players are hurt. You're going to have to play without them. But the other guys have to be able to say, look, we need you to be very physical. We, You're going to have to stand up to it. And I, I don't think our defensive line was really out physical. I, I just think Cleveland offensive line had 20, almost 20 more snaps than our offense, right? Yep. <laughs> and right. I do they, think, they ran 19 more plays, 19 more right. snaps. Yep. I think our defense kind of wore down. And that's why yep. the plays started coming late. I think our defense did wear down. So these guys are back. We were thin. We were playing a lot of guys uh, who had to not only play, but had to play a lot of snaps when they were used to being the backups. So I, I think those guys will be fine defensively. On offense, though, We've got to have a much more physical mentality. We, we've got to we've got to be able to win in the trenches, and we're not able to do it. And you can tell by the 
not just by the uh, few rushing attempts, by just the lack of productivity when we do decide to run, by the lack of productivity when we do get under center and, and decide we're going to get physical. We may have one moment, but we don't have sustainable moments or sustainable momentum in the run game that allow us to dictate terms. I find it hard to believe that you could dictate tempo and physicality by throwing the ball 70% of the time. And that's what we're at around 69% pass, um, 30, 33% run. I, I just find it hard to believe we could do that, particularly as the weather is about to change and balls are going to be wet. Um, and it's going to be really cold. We're going to have to be able to run the football, to be able to control the tempo of the game, to be able to dictate tempo and, and be able to be physical and short yardage and goal line play so we don't have to do the gimmicks where we can just knock you off the ball. Those are the things that win football games. This, David, hasn't changed a whole lot. No. If Paul Brown were here, he would say the same thing. You, you and I both know that. And um, so – uh, we're going to have to get back to doing some of the more fundamental things. I, look, I can tell you right now, I'm I'm playing Chris Evans a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I'm playing some RJP Ryan a little bit more. I'm not saying this is all about Joe Mixon because that's I still think he needs to begin to make the first defender miss in space, and he's catching the ball out on the perimeter. He's got to make the first guy miss. Yep. Look at the combination of what Nick Chubb is doing just with the first unblocked defender, because that's all. There's many times we don't do a good job of getting Joe back to the line of scrimmage. So that part is on the offensive line. Every running back, whether it's Joe Mixon or Samar J.P. Ryan or Chris Evans, to me, I'm grading, if I'm the the coaches, I'm grading my running backs, can you win against the first unblocked defender? And at what ratio – are we able to get that done? And that's the guy who's going to play. That's the yeah. guy who I've got to get the ball to. You see that happening in Dallas with a Tony Pollard, Ezekiel Elliott. We know Ezekiel Elliott is the better running back all around. Right. And you're paying him the most money. But this other guy, Tony Pollard, why is he averaging nine yards per touch? Why does he have three touchdowns when we, when we play him? And, and so you've got to – to me, competition means something for football teams. And when players are are performing, you've got to reward that. And you've got to give them opportunities. That's the only way the team gets better. And I think at the wide receiver position, T. Higgins is going to perform. Tyler yeah. Boyd is going to perform. I think T. was sensational last night. The officials, I don't know why they can't see. They're holding him. They grab him. They can't stop the guy. They can't stop him. So yeah. we're going to be okay. And I think – what we need to do is look at without Jamar, we've got Higgins and we got Boyd. You got to, your third receiver is not necessarily the third wide receiver. Right. Your third weapon or your third option in the passing game has to either be, and I think it can go between Hayden Hurst yep. and, Chris, and Chris Evans. Mm-hmm. I, I think Evans got to get on the field a little bit more. He's got a little bit of juice, he's got a little bit of wiggle until he proves to you that he doesn't. But Everything that we've seen, he's got to look. he just adds a different dimension than our other two running backs, who I absolutely love. But quickness and speed, accounts and playmaking ability, right? If we're going to throw it as much as we're going to throw it, then you've got to look, okay, who's going to be uh, the third option in the passing game outside of Higgins and Boyd? And then who's going to be that fourth option? And I don't care if it's a wide receiver, a running back, or a tight end. But it's got to be a guy that can win his matchup battles against the opposing defense. And and you, the two things you talked about, I mean, were, you know, during the course of the game, I was like, man, Cleveland is tackling. They're not missing any tackle. They're shrinking space. Yeah. And you know, they're they're coming downhill on those swing pads, and they're shrinking space, and they are getting people on the ground. And their tackling was was a thing of beauty. Taki Taki was just unbelievable. And and you, as you talk about the Bengals' worst nightmare. Uh, they ran 19 fewer snaps. They only ran 50 plays. The Browns ran 69. The Browns had a 13 minute and 30 second time of possession advantage, yeah. almost a quarter. I mean, they ended up playing keyboard. The Bengals' worst fear was a realization. That's why they wanted to go down and score first. That's right. You know, and, and and you know, try to make Cleveland change their mindset a little bit and maybe score again. And that turnover, they just 
they they were stunned by it and really never got uh, never get past it. But I'll tell you, that that's uh, that's not an easy thing to make those leverage those tackles in space the way Cleveland was doing it, and they didn't miss. They they were yeah. they were deadly, weren't they? Well, they did a good job of shrinking the space and then yeah. wrapping up when they tackled. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And then getting help from other guys. That's that game tackling usually lend itself to good results defensively, but offensively. The, our game plan is, as you said, you get the lead and then if you force the other team or the coach to wonder if he can stick with that patient right. uh, mentality of how long do I continue to run the ball when I'm chasing points, which is what happened to us. You know, we're chasing points. We get down 11 nothing. Now we're just come forget about the run game. We got to we gotta throw it in order to get points because we're chasing points. We're working against the clock. That's what we did against Atlanta. We took them out of their run game because, bam, touchdown, another touchdown. And after a while, Atlanta's not going to try to run the ball. They're down 21 nothing. They're down 28 to 7. I mean, it's forget about it. That's what we wanted to do to help protect our defense against the onslaught of Nick Chubb and the Cleveland Browns running game. But when we fell behind, it allowed Kevin Stefanski to stay committed and more patient with the run game, which wasn't really clicking for the Browns early in the game. Right. Okay. It didn't start to really work for them until later in the second half, just before halftime. And then they came out and really cranked it up in those first two drives in the third quarter. That's where you saw separation. Next thing you know, they're up 25 to nothing. And that's where the game got away from the Bengals in Monday night's game. So what do you think is the most important thing? Um, Give me a couple of things that you might be looking at as the Carolina Panthers come to town. What do you have to do? How do you get it? Uh, how do you get this game, this all important game in the W column? Like players were saying in the locker room after the game, hey, last year we were five and four after nine games. They could be five and four going into the bye. You know, they were seven and six in the, in the middle of November. But I'm telling you, that 0 and 3 mark in the division, four year losses are to division opponents. Man, you gotta you gotta start winning some games and stacking wins together because you don't want to get to those tiebreakers, man. That is true, uh, but I do think everything that they want to accomplish right now is out in front of them. Yep. I mean, so there there's nothing that say coming into the season if all the things we want to do, win the division, go deeper to the play, all those things are still possible even as we sit here today. They're at five hundred. They're not below five hundred. They're, they're right now after eight games. They're at five hundred. Yep. Do they need to crank it up? Absolutely. And here are the things that they need to do. The offensive line just has to communicate better. They've got to be just more intuitive with what they're doing. This isn't rocket science, okay? If Samar J. P. Twist. Ryan, Super yeah, <laughs> and if and if Samar J. P. Ryan or Joe Mixon is chipping, right? Uh, Don't sit you, outside. Sit inside. You can't let the the defensive end spin and, and beat you inside Ugh. and get the sack on our quarterback. You, Man. you've got help on the, that's, this is this what we saw in the Monday night game. Defenses are going to continue to do to us until we get it right. Yep. And I, I said, um, the fundamentals of our game are what you talked about. It's blocking, tackling, it's running, it's catching and throwing. And then after that, hold on to the ball. <laughs> there you go. You just do those things. And don't, even if the ball's on the ground, I remember Dick LeBeau, we would do fumble recovery drills. Sure. He said, guys, there's going to come a time now that ball's going to be on the ground. You got to know how to fall on it. <laughs> he really, and, and he would put us through these drills to teach us how to, how to recover a fumble because they're critical. If the ball's on the ground, you have an opportunity to get it. You got to get it. Yep. Um, that's the same as cat as dropping a potential touchdown catch. You got to possess the ball when you have the opportunity to possess, whether it's a catch or whether it's a fumble recovery. Um, I'll tell you, the legendary, you got to be able to do that. The legendary Paul Brown Solly. We started every practice with routine tackling drill. Yes. Informed tackling, taking people to the ground. Yeah. Even the quarterbacks, because Paul's yeah. like, you know. You throw an interception. I don't want it to be a pick six. I want you to get that guy in the ground. You know, that's and right. I mean that—that's the ABCs, right? I mean, hey, yeah, yeah, locking and tackling. That's that's the game of football. No matter 
how fancy you get at some point you got to block people you got to tackle yeah. people. and dave this is how you know there was something weird going on on monday night it, it was halloween i get it I, but when evan mcpherson is missing field goals and extra points my man had nothing to do with the holder of the snap this time yep yep I'm just like, wait a minute. This is not our team. Something happened. Somebody took our players, stole our uniforms, <laughs> went up to Cleveland. And started, this is not, these aren't our guys. I can tell you. It's like I, I was I was just uh totally uh miffed. It was a, it was one of the more frustrating nights. But hey, you know, I believe in these group of guys now. I really do. Uh this is also where I think. The psychological components of coaching and teaching players, uh, you know, and I, I trust that Zach will be able to have these conversations with the players and say, hey, you know, last year the success came. Uh, you guys, uh, you, you handled that well. Now let's see how you deal with the setbacks. Things are less than optimal when you lose a DJ Reader, when you lose a Trey Hendrickson for, for a spell, uh, when you lose a Jamar Chase. They're less than optimal. Uh, but there, if you look across this league, every single team has players missing. Yep. Every single team has starters that are out and can't play. This is where we begin to build a championship team because our depth is going to help us. The Dallas Cowboys are sitting here. I think they've only lost one game since uh, Dak Prescott's been out. And they, they're without their star running back in Ezekiel Elliott. They gave Amari Cooper to the Dow, to uh, the Cleveland Browns right? and still have other guys stepping in and winning, other guys stepping in and winning. There has to be a conversation with the players about we. you cannot go into a contest, which not saying that's what they were thinking, but, uh, you know, I know I would be sort of a little bit, whoa, no Jamar Chase. We don't have, now that you can't expect that the other 52 guys are going to automatically say, oh, we'll be okay. No, that's not a given, right? So there has to be a conversation psychologically to help your team process that and deal with it and be prepared to respond. And that's what it's all about, Solly. Appreciate uh, appreciate your time. I mean, Carolina Panthers come to Paycor Stadium, short week, but you got to have a get-right game, and uh, it, it's, it's time for that get-right game. You want to go into the bye week over 500, at five and four rather than the other way around. There's no two ways about that. And as always, Solly, tremendous knowledge. Appreciate you sharing it with us. And I uh, can't thank you enough for carving time because I know you are a busy man. Well, thanks for having me. I'm sending out an all points bulletin around town looking <laughs> for looking for Luke Keekley. Okay, he's a Cincinnati guy, but I'll, I don't want him hanging out over there with the Panthers on their sideline, okay? We got to make sure, make sure he's hanging out with us. <laughs> what a great player he was, man. He's Whew. great, but truly a great Unbelievable. one. And, and proud of him, uh, the, way that he's, the way that he played, the way that he carries himself. And, uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the kind of player and the kind of person he is. And that's the kind of player and person you are as well, Solly. Thanks for your time, sir. All right, Dave. Thank you. All the best. Same. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Tennessee knocking.